60,000. That's the average number of songs added to Spotify every day. 60,000 new songs daily, tens of millions of songs every year. There are more songs on Spotify than one person could ever physically have the time to listen to. And with 160 million paying users, more than double as much as the next music service, I think we can all agree Spotify holds the keys to modern music as we know it. Big business having its hand in music is nothing new, but in the last five to 10 years, Spotify has completely disrupted the entire industry. Despite Spotify creating an entirely new paradigm of listening, making songs and albums more accessible and easily discovered than ever before, many musicians now feel like the music industry is more brutal and unfair than ever, and it seems to just keep getting worse. So I want to answer the question that just keeps coming back. Did Spotify f the music industry? If you're interested in more of my creations, I just launched the spirit of creativity that I started by myself with the mission of telling a true story, reminding artists, musicians, and creators everywhere to just keep moving forward and chase your dreams no matter what. So go to volksgeist.store to get $10 off the spirit of creativity for the next week and free shipping in the US forever. Shipping begins in late December. Spotify was founded by Daniel Ek, a Swedish chrome dome, alien looking tech guy all the way back in 2006. But the platform didn't see a rise in popularity until the early to mid 2010s when they launched in the US, started offering a free version with ads and raised a couple billion dollars in startup funds all at the same time. But before Spotify, the biggest legal music retailer was the iTunes store that sold albums for around $10 a piece. iTunes was already a big step forward for the music industry since it was cheaper and easier than buying CDs, but the success of iTunes was pretty chaotic since it was around this time that Napster came along and nearly killed the music industry. And Napster is a pretty important thing to understand if you're gonna get why Spotify exists. Napster was an app that linked computers and allowed people to access each other's MP3 files for free. And by the time it was two years old in 2001, it was used by tens of millions of people. It was pretty huge. Its creator ended up on the cover of Time Magazine, and the app was considered a major step forward for the connection between music and the internet. Suddenly, everything was available all the time in a way it had never been before. But the problem was that Napster had no control over what got shared on their app. It wasn't like they could take things off their servers because there were no servers. It was people sharing files directly from their own computers to other people's computers all over the world. Before Napster, the most popular way to get albums was to pay $15 or $20 a piece for CDs. But now, everything was free and you could have it whenever you wanted. Of course it was popular, but it was eventually knocked over by so many copyright lawsuits that they couldn't afford to keep the platform online anymore, and Napster closed after just three years. After Napster fell apart, there were many other platforms like LimeWire, BitTorrent, and SoulSeek that offered a similar service and remained popular to some degree for years. The iTunes store came along a few years later and it offered the have as much as you want internet convenience at slightly cheaper prices than CDs. And it did really well. But the idea of having as much music as you could possibly want at all times for free on the internet never quite went away. Over the next 10 years, the music industry's yearly revenue went down 50%. It wasn't until 2014 when music streaming started to become mainstream that the music industry's revenue started increasing again after almost 15 years of steady decline. Year after year with seemingly no end in sight, CDs, downloads, vinyls, tapes, it got so bad that in 2012 the American music industry made less money than it did in 1982. So Daniel Ek has said that Napster inspired Spotify. He knew there was no way to successfully get rid of piracy because once people got a taste of getting all their music all the time whenever they wanted for free, it wasn't gonna go away. So in a way, even though Napster was closed down forever, it still won. The music industry was never the same again. It seemed to Daniel Ek like the only path forward was to offer a service so convenient that it could actually eliminate people's desire to pirate music altogether. And so Spotify was founded as a kind of solution to a big, big problem. The music industry was really suffering back then. So when Spotify came to the US in 2012, it blew up. There was no reason to go through the hassle of managing pirated files on your hard drive when you could have complete control over all the music you ever wanted all the time from any device. So it's been the king of the music industry ever since, with over 220 million paying customers and half a billion users in total. Spotify pays out 70% of their revenue to artists and their total revenue in 2022 was $12.5 billion. Compared to the $30 billion that the entire music industry made last year, 
they're definitely one of the big dogs, if not the biggest. So why do people hate them? Why is it such a common thing to say that Spotify has turned music into a gray goo and hurt both the economics and artistry of the music industry? When you look closer, you start to see what people mean. The majority of artists who publish to Spotify make between four and six dollars per thousand streams. And maybe that sounds decent, but when you add it up, it becomes clear that this isn't gonna be a living wage for most people. You would need two million streams a month to make about $5,000, which is a decent paycheck, not an amazing one, but that's still before you consider all the equipment, resources, studios, and taxes and business necessary to actually make enough music to sustain those sort of streams. Let's look back in the past. I think you can imagine why so many artists feel they aren't paid fairly for their work. In order to count how many sales an album gets for the charts, Billboard says that 1,500 Spotify streams count as one sale. That's about $5. If your album went platinum during the CD era, 1 million sales at $15 per CD, that would be $15 million in revenue. If your album goes platinum from Spotify streams, that's 1.5 billion streams, you're gonna get $3 million. Do you get it? And I think you can all imagine how this affects more than just millionaires. This affects every artist that publishes their music on streaming services. And at this point, that's just about everybody. But over the years, many musicians have protested by not making their albums available at all on Spotify. Taylor Swift removed all her music from Spotify for three years because of unfair compensation to producers and writers and artists. The legendary rock band King Crimson didn't put their music on streaming services until 2019 because the pity money they would have gotten paid wasn't even coming close to what they could make by selling physical copies through their website. Why would they add more ways to make money if it was just gonna water down their bottom line? Jay-Z was also often of Spotify completely until 2019 after speaking many times over the years on how Spotify wasn't paying artists what they deserved and how he would rather get nothing from them than support their business model. Even Coldplay just straight up didn't put their new music on Spotify for years, saying they'd rather not give in to the unfair system. The band Tool also had no music on Spotify until 2019. Spotify has essentially won the battle to conquer the entire music industry. If you think back, you know, eight or nine years ago, it was kind of a question, will a big artist join Spotify? Will they upload their stuff to the platform? But at this point, it's not a question anymore. Every single person that makes music today is uploading their music to Spotify. But the other side to that is that Spotify, and this is one of the main reasons why artists continue to use it at all, is essentially a democracy. Anybody can upload their music on Spotify all the time with no limitations for like $20. And you can make music at home basically for free. It's not like Netflix, it's not Amazon Prime Video, it's not a DVD store or record store. Anybody can join anytime. And in this new era where everyone can have a voice, there are crazy success stories like the 17-year-old singer David recording romantic homicide on his phone in his closet with $5 earbuds and a free app. The song went on to get 850 million Spotify plays, it reached number three on the charts, it made over two million dollars in streaming revenue on Spotify alone. Even 20 years ago, things like that weren't really technologically possible. These platforms are opening doors that were never open before. Everyone has a chance to be heard and to speak, including people who never would have even have had a chance to get in a studio at all. Old Town Road is another amazing example. That's a song that's the longest running number one ever. And it was made for $25. And this new way of sharing, creating, and publishing music has created some amazing careers and songs and albums that we never would have heard if it weren't as easy to find and share music as it is, thanks to services like Spotify. Let's say it's 30 years ago. You know, you go to the music store, there are a few thousand CDs on the shelves, if that, and you know, there are a few thousand albums to choose from, but you can't possibly buy and listen to all of them. Sure, the artists who made it into the store would make a bunch more money than they would on Spotify per sale, but how many people really made it into the store? How many CDs did the stores hold? How much effort, publishing, contracts, investment, stocking, warehouses, logistics, record deals? There were so many crazy logistics required to mass produce and sell your music at retail. Spotify, in theory, solves this big issue. I have a library that contains thousands of albums, many, many more that I could ever afford to buy or keep in my house if they were physical CDs. I have obscure Japanese ambient and 1970s European folk music, New York City drill rap, traditional South American flute covers of Simon and Garfunkel songs. Nothing ever goes out of production. Nothing gets forgotten. Right now, thanks to Spotify, is the best time ever to discover and enjoy music. I can scroll through YouTube and fall in love with things I've never heard before and never would hear if it weren't for these platforms. But there's still something strange happening with new music. 
Songs and albums are fundamentally changing to match the new technology we use to listen to music. Spotify is changing music. Originally, vinyl records could fit around 70 minutes of music, if that. So that's how long albums could be, and that limitation eventually became the fundamental base characteristic of a music album. A lot of classic albums are 10 or 15 songs long, but it's 2023 and that limitation doesn't really exist anymore. So artists have been cramming more and more music onto their albums because that's the only way to get sales. If your album is 10 songs long in 2023, you get half as many sales as if it's 20 songs long. Album quality and replayability now has almost nothing to do with making it onto the charts and getting paid. As long as your song gets played for at least 30 seconds, the artist is getting a payout from Spotify. Recent big rap albums like Donda, For All the Dogs, Lil Durk's Almost Healed, Utopia, they're way longer than they needed to be, and all of those could have been really good albums if they were like 40% shorter, in my opinion. I think this is contributing massively to the forgettability of modern music. Albums don't need to be an hour or an hour and a half or two hours long. You can't possibly remember and go back to and fall in love with all of the 34 songs on Pop Smoke's last album. Yes, his label made a posthumous album with 34 songs after he died. Even Lil Uzi's Pink Tape was so hyped, but it was 26 songs long, which is an insane amount. You can't make an album with 26 songs be worth listening to over and over. It's impossible. But artists continue doing this in favor of better streams and sales numbers. They're sacrificing long-term memorability for the fans. Back when people were buying CDs, tapes, and vinyls, it made sense to make songs about as long as they could be. You were getting paid once for that sale and you wanted to make the song worth people's time. Today you're getting paid every time your song is played. So why not just shave that song length down more and more so you get paid a few extra times? Look at Kanye's graduation from 2007. In the middle of the CD era, some of the best songs on this album are four or even five minutes long. Stronger is one of Kanye's biggest ever hits. It's over five minutes long. That's twice the length of songs these days. Lil Yachty's Poland, that was a big viral hit. It's like a minute and a half long. Old Town Road, biggest song ever, under two minutes. Ice Spice and Pink Panther S blew up doing songs that are so short that people joked about their concerts being over in 15 minutes. Obviously, TikTok is a big reason for this trend, but Spotify plays a part too. For about the last five years, artists have seen a huge financial incentive for making their songs more replayable, but their albums less. Even a huge star like Drake now makes songs that are three minutes long at most, while his older albums had tracks that could be five, six, or even seven minutes long. I think this is one of the main reasons why X's question mark ended up being one of the most streamed rap albums ever. I mean, aside from the fact it was a pretty good album, the average song length on that project was like two minutes. And the way that this new incentive changes how artists operate is pretty significant. Ever since the mid-1960s, when bands like the Beatles pioneered albums as an art form, a self-contained narrative, it became the case that artists would take years before album releases, tease and preview projects for months, they would define whole eras of the career around different albums, they would seek to make the best project they could. But now that the format and structure of albums is being devalued, it's becoming more common for artists, especially in hip hop and pop, to just repeatedly throw ideas out and see what works. Even artists as big as Drake and Taylor Swift are releasing new material constantly, far more than almost any other artist at their level ever did in the past 50 years. But when everyone is dropping tons of music, a ton of music starts to feel a bit less special. Because of this, I think Spotify and a lot of services like it have fundamentally changed changed how music sounds, and in my opinion, they've made it worse. There's a really good Vice article that points out more changes, and I'm going to quote from it here. What does the shrinking of songs mean for the craft of songwriting? Research shows that 25% of listeners will reach for the skip button in the first five seconds. For songwriting teams whose job it is to maximize their playlisting and streaming, that means erasing the boring bits from their songs. Fade outs and intros are gone. Now hooks come right in at the beginning of the song, and choruses arrive earlier and earlier. I especially like how they phrase their conclusion. They said, sure, there will always be acts who remain wildly successful without playing these games, and there will always be room for experimentation. But it's clear that younger generations now expect different things from songs, and the changing dynamics of music consumption reflect that. In my opinion, it's pretty clear that even though music is now incentivized to sound different thanks to streaming services and the way they pay, that doesn't mean good music is going to get choked out by bad music. It just means that the general sound of the pop landscape is changing drastically. But ultimately, none of these new trends 
are set in stone. Brent Fayez just dropped a short album. Larger Than Life is barely 35 minutes long and is amazingly creative and fresh. Steve Lacey's Gemini Rights was a huge hit last year and it has just 10 songs. Future's latest album was fairly short at 16 tracks and it's a much more interesting and memorable project than the majority of rap albums that came out at that time last year. Jack Harlow's Jackman was much better than his horrible Come Home The Kids Miss You album, which was 50% longer and full of filler garbage. I think artists do get this, but most of the time it's impossible to turn away from the plain and simple fact that if you make your album longer, it will do more sales. I would sum up the situation with a quote from Joey Badass in a Complex interview. Joey Badass once told Complex that a good album should have no more than 14 songs with duration varying between 30 to 45 minutes. He said, I don't care if it was a Michael Jackson album, I am not listening to 25 songs. But it seems pretty unlikely that albums start shrinking again until another fundamental change comes along in the way that the music industry works. Right now, the way Spotify pays and the way that the rise of Spotify has changed the rules, a lot of artists will just continue to make their albums longer and their songs shorter until it stops working. And that's really the core of the story, the music industry. I can't blame artists for doing what gets them paid. After everything I described with how unfair streaming has been to the average artist, I'm not gonna turn around and blame people for doing whatever they can, however they can. But of course, there's also an even longer list of strange, controversial, or just downright unethical things Spotify has done over the past few years. In 2018, they served Drake ads to every single Spotify user and put Drake's face on every playlist title on the platform, which went directly against their promise of being ad-free and led to a bunch of refunds being issued for people who thought that they weren't getting their money's worth anymore. Maybe one of the strangest things they've done is discovery mode, where they offer to take more royalties in exchange for bumping up certain artists in the algorithm. They market it as a good feature for artists who want to be discovered, but who doesn't want to be discovered? And if everyone's using it, isn't the impact going to be completely canceled out, which just leaves Spotify taking a cut off the top of millions of artists while offering little to nothing in return? And of course, I can't forget to mention the Spotify discovery and playlist algorithms and how those changed how music works as well. In a quote that I found from Ben Badez on readrange.com, he wrote this explanation. From a business perspective, Spotify has mentioned that their algorithm is designed to specifically keep your finger as far away from the skip button as possible. Every time you hit it, it's a point against the song for inclusion in future Spotify playlists. They're rooted in familiarity, says an official Spotify press release about the mixes feature. And while this might be a fantastic new development for someone looking to add the appropriate ambiance to a dinnertime conversation, study session, or party, issues begin to arise for the active listener. To keep the unbroken stream and the pursuit of the right vibe for any given situation going, Spotify's algorithm is designed to recommend songs that sound the most like other songs. Artists making music tailored for syncing into the background and not breaking the immersion of the listening experience are rewarded with prime placement on Spotify's curated playlists, taking the financial incentive for making something innovative and groundbreaking away. A listener showing the algorithm they have eclectic taste might get some great recommendations, but the algorithm is always going to want to push things back towards the middle, requiring the active listener to stay diligent about finding their own great music for themselves. In a world where algorithms don't just suggest things for us to discover and enjoy, but genuinely define our listening habits, it's almost like the same issue as the music industry had before. A few voices get pushed to the top and everyone else stays at the bottom. And us listeners suffer too. Without staying aware and challenging ourselves, music truly will become one big goo. So ultimately, the story of Spotify is a pretty mixed one. On the one hand, they've continued a lot of the bad practices that have made the music industry hostile towards artists since the very beginning. But also, in a way, Spotify saved the music industry as we know it. Again, back in the early 2010s, the music industry was on life support, and without music streaming services, of which Spotify would be the first big one, it's anyone's guess what would have happened. And they do pay tens of billions of dollars out to artists every year. Regardless of whether the pay is fair or not, Spotify basically did solve the problem of people expecting all music for free, and at least helped make sure that the music industry didn't completely die with the rise of the internet. At a time when it had lost 50% of its overall revenue in 15 years, Spotify convinced customers to at least pay a little bit instead of absolutely nothing. Is Spotify great for artists and listeners? Not really. Is it great for the corporate people who run it? 
pretty much. It doesn't pay very well, and it's hard to get noticed on a platform that pushes bigger artists to the top. But is it even possible to create a better business model that suits the needs of the average listener in 2023? The truth is probably not. Most average listeners aren't willing to go buy things on vinyl or pay for a record on Bandcamp. In a world where the average person feels like we deserve to listen to any song ever made at a moment's notice all the time, people are gonna get that one way or another. Spotify didn't invent that idea, and honestly, they pay a thousand million percent more than things like Napster and LimeWire did back in the day. Spotify invented a way to allow us to get what we want and meet the standards of the consumers while only kind of screwing over the artist instead of completely screwing them over with piracy. Artists absolutely do deserve better, but exploitation and bad deals are essentially the definitive story of the music industry. And true art succeeds in spite of the music industry, not because of it. Did Spotify fuck the music industry? In a way, yes. But more than that, it was already fucked and probably will be forever. Mixing art with industry is a recipe for disaster. But in the world we really actually live in, it's almost the only way to get your art to the world at all. That's also why I started this channel, as a way to make art mean something. All the artists I cover, all the artists we all look up to, they've changed the world in some way, but they all have one thing in common. They had to take the first leap and push forward to become who they are today. So often we talk about artist success through numbers and money and popularity, but we almost always forget what it takes to get there. But the first drop from my new brand is called The Spirit of Creativity, and it tells the story of every artist, student, entrepreneur, and creator. It flies through a dark night sky with silver stars and tells a story about always moving forward, representing the idea of working to achieve your goals even when it feels impossible to keep going, because that's when it matters the most. Creativity isn't supposed to be easy. I want to motivate all of you to pursue Pursue your own dreams and never give up. And the spirit of creativity does exactly that. By wearing this every day, I'm reminded that the only thing crazier than chasing my dreams is not chasing my dreams. The spirit of creativity is available at volksgeist.store right now. All orders are shipping in late December and they all come with free shipping in the US forever. And you can use the code VOLKS for a small extra discount for supporting my work.